For today's lesson, we're continuing our look at Lesson 6.3 by looking at 6.3b, comparing tables, graphs, and verbal descriptions. Our goal for today is to compare and contrast properties of two related functions represented by a table, graph, or verbal description. So in yesterday's lesson, we focused on tables and equations. Today we're going to keep tables as part of the process, but we're also going to include with that graphs and verbal description. So therefore, problems that have a graph must be done on graph paper. Now our process of working through these problems is very much the same as what we did yesterday. We need to identify the slope and the y-intercept, and then we're going to have some sort of follow-up question to determine how the, the functions actually compare to one another. So let's go ahead and get into it by taking a look at our first example. Example 1 says that Brian and Lisa have to take a typing test to see how many words they can type correctly. Brian's test results are represented by the table, while Lisa's results are represented by the graph. So as with yesterday's lesson, we want to identify the slope and the initial value or the y-intercept for these two functions. So let's start with Brian's table and see if we can determine the slope for his words per minute. So to find our delta x value, we want to look at how much the x value, or the minutes in this case, is going up by from one number to the next. So we add 2. Each time we're going to add 2. And for the number of words that he's able to type, we see that that is going up by 48. So we add 48 each time. And so now for Brian, we're going to find our rate of change as having a value of 48 over 2. So again, m is equal to 48 over 2. Now what that actually means is that Brian correctly types 48 words in 2 minutes. But we want to get the unit rate. We want to find out how many words he can type in 1 minute. So we would simplify that fraction. So we get, we get m is equal to 24 words per minute. Okay, So that's the rate of change for Brian. Now we also want to find the rate of change, or the words per minute, for, for Lisa as well. And so in order to do that, again, we're using rise over run for our graph. Now again, with graphs on my iPad, it's difficult for me to draw straight lines. But hopefully we can see that if we start at the origin, we rise up one grid line, run over one grid line. Rise up a grid line, run over a grid line. Um, and so that is our, that's going to be our slope for Lisa's rate of change. However, we have to keep in mind the this value of the scale for the minutes and the value of the scale for the words per minute. So if, let's just use this point here this point here, and then the origin as well, as our points that we're going to use rise over run for. So if we start at the origin, rise up two grid lines, we're actually rising up 50 units. So we're rising 50, and then running right 2. So our slope is going to be rise 50, run 2, which is going to give us a value of 50 over 2. So again, for Lisa, her slope is 50 over 2, meaning that she types 50 words in two minutes time. So what we're going to do then is simplify that to find out how many words she would type per minute. So 50 over 2 simplifies to m is equal to 25 words per minute. Now with these two functions we don't really have to worry about initial value because both of them have an initial value of 0. They're not going to start with a a uh, head start of 10 words already typed or anything like that before the test begins. They're also not going to wait a half minute before they begin and then therefore reduce their initial value. But for both students, they're typing, they start right when the time begins. And Brian, we see, types 24 words per minute. Lisa types 25 words per minute. Therefore, we can conclude that Lisa is a faster typer than Brian. And so in comparing these two functions, we would just have for an answer, Lisa is a faster typer because she types 25 words per minute, 
while Brian only types 24 words per minute. All right, so I wrote that note out for us. Lisa's a faster typist with a rate of 25 words per minute, while Brian types 24 words per minute. And that could be our answer for that specific problem. All right, so that's our first example, comparing graphs and tables. We're going to take a look at one more example. This one is going to be comparing graphs and a verbal description or a word problem type scenario. For our second example, we have you want to buy a gaming system that costs $500, but you don't have all the money for it yet. Two stores will allow you to purchase it on layaway. Store 1 requires a down payment of $200 plus $50 per week while store 2 is represented by the graph. So let me kind of explain what's going on here. For store 1, in order to get the gaming system, you pay them $200. So you give them $200 right away, and then you have to figure out, all right, how much money do you have to pay back still? And then once you figure out how, many, how much money you have to pay back still, how long is it going to take you to pay back the money that you still owe? For the graph, what we have is we have store 2 represented there. And so the balance that you would owe at store 2 would be $200. Now, this is not the same $200 that is required at store 1. Instead, we need to think of it this way. Your balance here starts off at $200. If your balance starts off at $200 and the gaming system costs $500, how much of a down payment would they require? So we can see that if your remaining balance right away is going to be $200, that must mean that they would require a $300 down payment. So store three, we can see, uh, store three, store two, we can see would require a $300 down payment, leaving you with a balance of $200 right away. What we need to do for store 2 is we need to figure out the rate of change that we have here which would tell us how much money we need to repay each week. But let's take a step back and focus just on store 1 to begin with. Now store 1 again requires a $200 down payment. So you ask for layaway on the console or the the gaming system and you have to pay them an initial uh, you have to pay them an initial amount of $200. So if you pay them right away, if you have to pay them right away $200, what is your balance going to be after you give them that $200? So the initial value for store 1 is actually going to be $300. That's how much your balance is going to be after you make the $200 payment. You make the $200 payment off of $500, and you're left with a balance of $300. So the initial value or the initial amount that you owe is going to be $300, and they require that you pay back $50 per week. So for store one, we have an initial value or amount that we owe. The initial balance is going to be $300 that we owe, and they expect us to pay back $50 per week. Okay, so store one, start off with a $300 balance after paying the $200 deposit, and then we have to pay back $50 per week. Now let's go back to the graph and look at store two again. Now for store two, represented again by the graph, we've already said that our balance is going to be $200. So they would require a $300 down payment and then your balance would start off as $200. So the easy part is to figure out how much we owe after paying the deposit. So we would owe $200, so that would be the initial value. So for store two, again, the initial amount that we would owe, this is after the deposit is paid, would be $200. That's how much we still have to pay after we pay our $300 deposit. Now we need to figure out from the graph what the rate of change is going to be. So coming back to look at the graph, it's kind of difficult again to draw a line 
on uh, on the iPad, but I feel like I did a pretty decent job with this one. Um, essentially, what you could do is you could just start up here, where our initial value is, and you could rise down all the way to here, and then you could run over here to where our gaming system would be all paid off, and we can use those values as our rate of change. Or we could use them as our rise over run to find our rate of change. So let's start here. And for our rise, we're going to go down 200 units. Okay, again, we start up here. We rise down 200 units. So our rise is going to be negative 200. And our run is going to be 8. From 0 over to 8 gives us 8. So our slope is going to be negative 200 over 8. Now, obviously, we cannot leave it that way as a slope of negative 200 over 8. We need to simplify that. And so hopefully you can do this without a calculator. If you can't, that's okay. Go and divide 200, negative 200 by 8, and we should end up with m is equal to negative 25 dollars per week. So we're paying back $25 a week, meaning we're decreasing the amount that we owe them by $25. Every time we make a $25 payment, we're decreasing the amount of money that we owe them. So if we go back to store one, we should notice that we made a mistake there with our slope. If our balance is $300 to start with, we're not increasing the amount of money that we owe when we pay them. We're decreasing the amount of money that we owe them. So our slope for store one should also be negative. It should be negative $50 per week. Switch that up, negative $50 per week at store one, and negative $25 a week at store two. So again, let's think about what we're doing. Store one, we start off by paying $200, and we have an initial value or amount that we remain on our balance of $300. We then pay off that $300 at a rate of negative $50 per week. Store two, on the other hand, we make an initial payment of $300, leaving us with an initial balance of $200. So we owe, we would owe store two $200 after we put down our deposit. Now for our slope for store two, we would pay $25 a week, which decreases the amount of money that we owe them by $25 a week. So in this problem, it's not a case of which one is better than the other because it completely depends on circumstances. Are you able to afford the $200 deposit at store one and then pay back $50 a week? Are you earning enough money? Are you earning $50 a week where you can repay that? If you're not earning $50 a week, then you probably aren't going to be able to pay that off, that $50 a week. But if you're making somewhere between $25 and $50 a week, then maybe making this option work for you would be better. So again, just to go through it one more time. Store one, we pay $200 initially, but that then leaves us with this $300, this $300 balance, which we have to pay off at a rate of $50 a week. Store two, on the other hand, would require a $300 deposit leaving us with an initial balance or amount that we owe of $200. Then we pay that $200 off at a rate of $25 a week. Now let's take this a step further. For store one, if we owe them $300 and we pay them back $50 a week, the question is how long will it take in order to pay off our balance completely? Well, all it is is a simple division problem. It would take six weeks to repay our balance. Okay? Store two should have been easier to see from the graph how long this would take us, but if we owe two hundred dollars, if we owe two hundred dollars and we pay back twenty-five dollars a week, it's gonna take us eight weeks to pay off our balance. So couple things to keep in mind if you're thinking of doing something like this can you afford the the initial deposit again two hundred dollars here 
$300 here. That's the initial deposit, not the initial balance. So the balance would be 300 here, but 200 here. Store one, can you afford $50 a week? If you can't, you probably want to go with store two. But if you want to have it all paid off in less time, going with store one would be the better option. Okay, so it's all just a question of your circumstances and how much money you make per week and those types of things that you have to consider if you're going to make a purchase in such a fashion. So this is not the type of problem where we would ask which store has a better value or a better deal or th something like that. This all comes down to personal preference and how much money you can afford per week. So what do you guys think? What would you prefer? Store one where you pay $50 back per week but you get it in six weeks or store two where you pay back less per week but it takes eight weeks to pay it off. It's all your personal preference. And going through those examples, we finished our lesson 6.3b, and hopefully you're now able to compare and contrast properties of two related functions represented by tables, graphs, or verbal descriptions. If you have any questions, please write them down, and we can go over them together when I come back from Florida.